Okay, well, since that's a page turn, um, let, let's just talk about the, the theme for a second. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, I would play the theme. It's marked Piano Espressivo, and I think the Espressivo gives you the license to, to be a little bit more songful with it, you know, not, not trying to um, tiptoe too much. Um, so it's just, it's kind of straightforward at first. And you have, of course, pages and pages to uh, elaborate on this simple theme. But in terms of its basic shape, now I don't, I don't play those um, last quarters loud because to me they're like, like someone scratching their head. What was that? You know, and it's kind of like nice if it's kind of you're winking a little bit while you play it. Um, if you take them out, it's pretty straightforward. Um, sorry, I have my music's over here. Um, so I like to play as if you're going, what, you know, and then, really, <laughs> you know, it's just like, that doesn't make any sense. And then he's going to elaborate on it and tell you what those weird notes mean at the beginning. Um, so we're going to do a two bar phrase, two bar phrase, and then a four bar phrase. Um, let's just do the theme. Yeah. You know, um, Minhi, I would not uh, disappear. But. So it doesn't completely die and leave a, a gap. Yeah, and, and not too much of a space. And you know, um, Dr. Anyi was um, a pianist. Uh, well, he was a composer, pianist, conductor, sort of the typical triple threat. But um, this, he's using this very old uh, form of composition, the Passacaglia, and inspired no doubt by the great uh, C minor Passacaglia of Johann Sebastian Bach, which he undoubtedly played on the keyboard. And the fact that the, the writing is very, very uh, keyboardish, you know, where you have multiple voices, and sometimes he even spells it out that way. So we, um, and of course, all the fast arpeggios, which are typical of piano and typical of Bach. Um, so I think, as I was saying, because it's, um, we don't need to be too mysterioso about the beginning. It's we present it with these strange notes, and then it becomes elaborate. I'll, I'll show you a little bit more. And a 
again, uh, all the way through the piece, what you'll be trying to do is give the, the proper shape to the melody. And the melody is in every single variation um, with a lot of notes in between. But so um, let's do the theme one more and just play it uh, simple, like you're singing it to yourself in a way. plainly marks it in this variation to have two voices. Um, so I would um, play the um, accompanying voice, the second voice, a little bit less. Um, and, you know, a good uh, practice technique all the way through is to um, you know, this reminds me of, it's a very common uh, compositional technique for, well, just about any type of composers. But you know the whole, like, Carmen fantasy era of melody and accompaniment notes, um, where the, it, it's meant to sound like two flutes. Um, and so we can, um, there, and there's so many pieces, I, you know, during the quarantine when I couldn't play, I rediscovered all the pieces by um, Bayham, you know, his uh, Nel Corpio and uh, the Schubert fantasy and the uh, Air Alamon fantasy. And, and it's always melody and accompaniments. And it was really meant to dazzle uh, two flutes. Or uh, even the Anderson uh, Opus 15. Um, <laughs> You know that one, right? Yes. Okay. So what I did as a practice technique when I was working on that etude, <laughs> and then you fill in as if you're the first flute and the second flute is going. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Same thing here. Uh, so in this uh, third variation. <laughs> so do that once and then add the other notes as if they're a secondary voice. And then I like to do a little funny thing here. Um, is you're you're going full speed ahead. Um, this to me is like two people having an argument. Um, one person is really angry, and the other person is trying not to react. Um, sort of like to calm down the person who's really angry. And I think because Dokchani wrote the last arpeggio uh, not to be played loud, it's like the calm person wins the argument. So the last, you know, it's like, okay, you win. Um, and I would connect this one because the it's the dominant, it needs to go connect to the next one. So.
let's let's rest there for a minute. This piece cool. is ex exhausting. Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, just a couple of things. Uh, the, one of the difficulties of this piece, uh, besides all the fast notes, is the breathing. And um, it's a very good um, exercise in figuring out how to sneak in air. Um, you know, when we play a piece like this with piano accompaniment, if they're a good accompanist, they sort of, they listen to where we're breathing and they wait and everything. But I've played this with orchestra. The orchestra doesn't care if you need to breathe. They're, you know, sawing away and they'll just keep going. Um, so what what the as I was mentioning uh, earlier is the trick to this kind of music. Um, do you know? Uh, I, I'm I'm always afraid to ask this question of young <laughs> players. Do you know who Jean Pierre Rampal was? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. um, and James Galway and uh, okay and my teacher Julius Baker. The first time I heard this piece was a performance that he gave in my hometown of Carmel in California. And it's what made me want to play the flute was this piece. Um, so um, it's near and dear to me, but um, two things about something that is this technically difficult. Um, my, my teacher, Julius Baker, never missed notes, never ever missed notes. And so I asked him one day, and it was puzzling to all of us who studied with him. And he said, uh, it's the grouping. He practiced very slow grouping in the fast notes. And he loved to practice things very, very slowly and carefully. So let me give you an example of what I mean by grouping. On the very last page, the finale, um, we have this little, this E major scale. So the grouping I would use is to the E. Then those three turnaround notes up to the A, I do as a, rather than a group of five, I only do three notes in that B. So in slow motion, it would sound like because once you're over that top, the fingering is easy. So now speed it up. No one will notice this. And in fact, in fact, it has a really nice effect of like you're at the top of a roller coaster and then you pick up speed as you go down. Uh, so you really can't tell, but this is how my teacher never missed notes. He knew to take time where it was most difficult. Um, another example of grouping is on, uh, that chromatic scale, um, rather than I found that I, the first group goes to the F sharp. And the reason that I stopped there is that the F natural involves this finger motion. That's a stumbling point. So, and when you practice it, And you do it with exaggeration of where the groups start and end. And then you put it together. Um, same thing going up. And here, I start the second group on the D natural. Um, because it's easier, and when you practice the groups, the, the first note of the group is like a it's like a buoy in the ocean that you grab onto. So going up to the C sharp, you don't want to start a group on the C sharp because all your fingers are off the flute, so there's nothing to secure it. And then when it's up to tempo, you can sort of hear the group, but you can control all the notes. Let's just try that as an example. Um, play the chromatic scale. And stop on the C sharp, grab the D, and finish it. Okay, don't rush the end. Okay, okay. see, so um, do your scales every day with 
my teacher was a big advocate of using the metronome. Mm -hmm. that certain fingerings are easier than others, and your fingers might um, speed up when it's easy and slow down when it's hard. <laughs> but um, one thing you can do in your scales is also tongue them, because then you have to keep your fingers even, otherwise it gets apart from your tongue. Um, I like the both Tafano Gobert and the um, Reichert uh, scales. <laughs> Um, so that it, it keeps you exactly right. Let's, let's do the habanera, everyone's favorite melody. Um, have you ever heard the opera? Yes. In the opera, the soprano sings the first part in G minor, and then the chorus comes in in G major, and it's uh, of course, but the soprano is is very very slinky, and she's talking about talking about how easily men are manipulated, um, and so it's not not too short. Um, the chorus and then the soprano comes in now I know the composer put dots on it but no soprano would sing it like that so you know how teachers are always saying play it like a singer would sing it with words and so um, but you know you can go to YouTube and find any number of famous sopranos singing this aria um, all right let's do a little bit of the variation and one thing that you can try doing, the, the melody notes are marked with accents, but I think it's better to do it with tenuto rather than an accent, um, and then compress the rest of the triplet like this. Um, so you hear the soprano singing while you're playing it. Let's try that. Good. A little practice tip for this um, difficult interval thing. Uh, sometimes we change the rhythms um, uh, with triplets. Um, if we have um, an eighth and two sixteenths set hard or sixteenths and an eighth, uh, we can reverse it. The trick is to find out what really causes the problem in the fingering. So you're doing like a diagnostic test on what actually is the difficulty. Um, you have also the F sharp to the top note is something you can practice separately um, and even do it slowly and slurred but to find both the airstream and the finger connection. <laughs> 